and Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to our March webinar for Evaluate, uh, From Valuing to Visualization, Data Interpretation and Reporting. Uh, I'm your host, Jason Burkhart, and with us also today is Lori Wingate uh, from Evaluate here at Western Michigan University. Behind the scenes with us today, we have Tracy Pixler Anderson at Maytech Networks and the ATE Resource Center at Maricopa Community College who's making sure this webinar runs smoothly. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. For those of you who aren't affiliated with the ATE program, ATE standard stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's an NSF program that's focused on improved technician education in fields like biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, nanotechnology, renewable energy, and others. Most of the funding goes to community colleges, but there are some work being done at other educational levels, including K through 12 and at four-year colleges. So when we say ATE, that's what we're referring to. And when we say STEM, that stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This webinar is presented through Blackboard, and we're going to take just a moment to orient you to some things you need to know to make the most out of your time today. It's clear by the hands that have been raised in the room that some of you may have been familiar with the Blackboard functions, but just in case there are any of you who don't, uh, we'll take a moment to familiarize you with the system. So if you didn't know how to raise your hand from the prior question, first thing that you can do is uh, right above the uh, participants window, there is a hand raised. Uh, you'll click there any time that you're asked to raise your hand. Your hand will go up in the room. So why doesn't everybody go ahead and try that now, see what happens. Um, so go ahead and click that little hand. Perfect, perfect, excellent. So I mentioned the participants box. That is the blue box right under the hand you just raised. Uh, this is where everyone who's attending this webinar's names are listed. You may see some folks you know. As a matter of fact, I see a number of folks I know. And it's fine to send them notes, but you should know that the moderators, such as myself, do see everything anyone types into the chat box, which is right there. The chat box is where you can type any questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. You can do this at any time, and we do encourage you to do so. Throughout the webinar, we'll be taking short question and answer breaks to capture those questions. So just to make sure that everyone can follow the conversation, be sure that when you send a chat message that the room tab is selected. That tab is located below the chat box to the far left. Let's go ahead and practice using that chat box now. Why don't we type the name of the organization we're from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you. All right, excellent. Looks like pe folks are getting the hang of that, and we've got people from all over the country, so welcome, United States. And uh, again, as I said, we'll be taking uh, question and answer breaks throughout, so please make sure you to keep those questions coming in the chat box, and we will address them at those breaks. If you do need to send a private message to someone, click your friend's name, and a new tab appears, and you'll see down here uh, where that new tab shows up. Just type your message in the box, and that note will be sent to your friend. However, it will also be seen by the moderator. Should something happen where you need technical assistance, you can obtain that by directly selecting Networks Admin in the Participants box, selecting the Networks Admin to, uh, tab down at the bottom of the screen, and um, typing the message to them. We have a number of materials today that will be available to you, uh, including handouts, uh, uh, slides, from the record, or slides from the webinar, and a recording of the webinar. Those are available from our evaluate.org website, evaluate.org, events, March 2013. Or you can just find it on the recent addiction section of our homepage. 
our objectives, and hopefully you share these objectives with us today, will be by the end of the webinar, we hope you will A, understand the role of evaluation questions as a basis for interpretation and visualization. Two, that you'll be aware of strategies for strengthening the linkages between evaluation data and conclusion. Three, you'll be able to apply data visualization techniques, which will help you to enhance your reporting. And number four, we hope you'll be inspired to learn more on your own about valuing and visualization. So without further ado, I will turn you over to Lori Wingate. Welcome, Lori. Thanks, Jason. And I want to give Jason a double thank you for stepping in at a very late notice as moderator today. So before we dig in, I wanted to just take a moment to give you an overview of how we're going to spend our time in this webinar in the next 90 minutes. We've covered introductions and housekeeping issues. And then in the first main part of this webinar, I'm going to review, um, as Jason alluded to, um, evaluation questions and what they are and their importance in evaluation. Um, val valuing and visualization, which is the main topic of this webinar, happen in a context defined by the purpose of an evaluation. And because of that, we really need to make sure we clarify what it is we're trying to find out with our evaluations. Then we'll have a, a break for questions and comments. And again, anytime you have, have one of those, just type it in the chat box. Jason will be keeping track of those, and we'll bring them up at the question breaks. Next, we'll cover, cover valuing and distinguishing between analysis and interpretation. And we'll look at examples of some rubrics that, and some other things that can help you, um, that will aid you in interpreting, interpreting results. Then we'll have a second question break. And in the third part, we'll discuss visualization, whether it's of a single indicator or summary conclusions. Then we'll have our final question break, and we've saved a little bit of time at the end for our webinar evaluation survey, which I'm sure none of you would leave before you completed that, and we appreciate your feedback. So what are evaluation questions, and why do we need them? Evaluation questions are overarching questions about a project's merit, worth, or significance that an evaluation seeks to answer based on evidence. Evaluation questions are not the same as survey questions, and we discussed this um, distinction in our last webinar in January. Ideally, we'll use multiple indicators drawing from multiple sources of data to answer these overarching questions about a project. Evaluation questions are just one means of expressing the boundaries or the focus of an evaluation. Um, it's really just what we're trying to find out. And we need to define the purpose of an evaluation so we can determine what data are relevant and what aren't and, and, how, and what kind of conclusions we need to draw. So let's take a look at where evaluation questions sit within an evaluation. So here, this is representing a project. Um, we've, used, we've used the typical logic model components to represent the project's activities, outputs, short-term outcomes, mid-term outcomes, and long-term outcomes. Then we have our evaluation questions, which should be closely aligned with the project's purposes and activities. And even if the purpose isn't articulated as, as questions, um, there is an explicit or at least an implicit purpose for the evaluation. And we should figure out what that is. Then we need to know what the indicators are that we're going to use as data for the evaluation to help us answer those questions. And these might come from a variety of data sources, as I've depicted here. Then we analyze, interpret, and synthesize the results to answer those evaluation questions. So in its simplest, simplest form, basically we ask questions, gather data, and then answer questions. And the main part of this webinar is going to be focused on answering questions. Um, but in the first part here, we're going to be talking a little bit about asking questions. You have to have questions to answer them. So why are we even having a webinar on this topic? Well, it's because we've observed three common pitfalls in evaluation across the spectrum, not just in ATE. And the first is failing to define the boundaries of an evaluation, either with questions or objectives. What's in and what's out? What do we need to know? What are we trying to do? Without clearly defining the purpose of an evaluation in some way, it's really difficult to make sense of the data we collect. 
In our last webinar in January, we discussed the importance of aligning data, the data that we collect, to these big evaluation questions. The second problem is um, making judgments without explicitly linking them to evidence. There may be plenty of data in an evaluation, but sometimes it's hard to tell how the evaluator translated that information into conclusions or judgments. This should not be a mysterious process, so that's what we're going to be addressing a lot today. Finally, a common problem is presenting the results from what I would call a data perspective rather than an interpretive or a use-oriented perspective. So here are the situations where um, the evaluator presents all the data points but doesn't overlay an interpretation on them or provide meaningful guidance on how to make sense of the results. So first we'll consider a couple of ways to come up with evaluation questions. So again, that's the definition of evaluation questions. Um, it's a common assumption that all we need to define the focus of an evaluation is the project goals. And it is true that goals are very important but they're rarely articulated in a way that they can do double duty as evaluation questions. I'll explain that. Ideally, our project goal statements are about our intended project outcomes, or in ATE, um, especially what is going to be different in the context of advanced technological education or employment um, because of the project. But what you actually see um, is that they're typically stated in terms of activities. We actually um, looked at a bunch of different abstracts for ATE projects, some from NSF's website, and um, kind of confirmed our suspicion that typically project goals or purposes um, are worded as activities um, when they do have any sort of goal statement in them. So we're going to look at a, a fictional project. Um, it's called ATE. Oh no, Project ATE 3D, and we, this is totally fictional just mainly because I think 3D printing is really cool. And if you don't know what 3D printing is, um, it is a process of making a three-dimensional solid object from a digital model. And it's done through an additive process where these layers of material, some sort of plastic, are laid down um, so it builds up the, the solid shape. And that, if I sound like Wikipedia, that's because that is the Wikipedia definition of it. But it's pretty cool. So if you actually NSF has a, a really neat video on its website right now. Um, if you just uh, put in 3D printing in their search box, it'll be one of the first things that's come up. So you should check it out. So in our made up project, we have three goals. Um, establish a process to solicit and implement 3D printing projects from the community. Develop and implement an interdisciplinary two course sequence on the application of 3D printing and provide students with support for continued professional growth. Now one way to get at evaluation questions from how a project has articulated its goals, for better or worse, is to brainstorm with stakeholders what should be investigated. So let's consider this second goal. Develop and implement an interdisciplinary two-course sequence. Um, let's think about this for a minute and maybe just type some ideas in, in the chat box about what kinds of questions we might ask uh, evaluation questions we might ask about um, this aspect of the project. You guys are being shy. Not seeing many ideas coming there. So maybe this is harder than that. There we go. Are the courses actually developed? What disciplines are involved? Are they the right ones for the project? Those are great examples. Um, yeah, is it following best practices? Was it well advertised? You could just sit around with your stakeholder group and, and, and come up with ideas about the things you could look at to evaluate this aspect of the course. Challenges faced in implementation. How are they developed? Um, the extent to which they're interdisciplinary. Right, so that's just brainstorming. And that's one way to go about it. And we may come up with a fine set of questions just doing this. Um, of course, we'd want to make sure that what, whatever we come up with actually matches the client's need and as well as NSF's expectations. Another way is to use a logic model framework. And I'm going to walk you through how you might do that. Lots more good examples coming through. Thanks, everybody. 
So a logic model, if you've been in any of our webinars, um, you know, is a or um, is a visual depiction like this of what a project does and what it's expected to accomplish. And there are a lot of ways to do logic models, but this format is fairly common. And this is one we tend to use um, for our examples. And activities are just what the project is doing um, with its grant money, and the outputs are the tangible, observable, countable, the things that are you know, we can really get our hands on that the project does. The short-term outcomes are typically changes in participants' knowledge, skills, attitudes. Mid-term outcomes tend to be what we expect to happen as a result of a change in knowledge, skills, or attitudes. For example, if you learn something because of this webinar, what might you do differently in your practice? And at the level of long-term outcomes, we're looking for changes in broader conditions. In ATE, it's largely about the quality and impact of technician education, although the project outcomes might be more specific than that. So it's nice to have questions that cover the entire spectrum of a project. Um, we can look at this in terms of process and outcome. Process evaluation questions are about the activities and outputs, and outcome evaluations are about outcomes, not surprisingly, and those can be anywhere along the outcome continuum. So let's um, consider how a logic model for this fictional project might be presented so then we can then sort of plug in the evaluation questions. First of all, what we what had been identified in those goal statements um, were actually the project activities. So we can just plug those right in here under the activity column. And then for outputs we can um, plug in the target numbers for how many of these community generated projects we'll have, um, how many students uh, we want to enroll or expect to enroll and from what departments. For short-term outcomes, we'll say we want students to gain soft skills and things like teamwork, communication problem solving, working on by working on teams to meet this, this client need, um, as well as competence, of course, in applying the 3D printing technology to real-world problems. Then it gets a little trickier. What do we want students to do differently because of their experience in this course? these courses. Um, we'll say because of this great practical experience, um, they will persist in their advanced technology programs. And because of the additional guidance we're going to provide them, they're going to go um, further in applying and developing their skills through um, experiential learning like internships and independent studies and maybe clubs and competitions and that kind of thing. But then what? Well, we want them to gain employment using their new credentials or continue on to a four-year degree. And once we have that logic model laid out, then we can align the questions to each component. At the level of activities and outputs, sometimes they're hard to distinguish. We might ask, to what extent do the community projects meet criteria um, for high quality problem-based learning? Because obviously it would be really important to have the right kind of projects for students to work on. As for the outputs specifically, we might want to investigate the degree to which the course has engaged the intended students, and some of you kind of touched on that with your questions about it being interdisciplinary, um, the num in terms of the numbers as well as the, the interdisciplinarity of the courses. Um, if one of the selling points of the grant proposal was the interdisciplinary focus, then this would be important to know if it was actually achieved. At the next level, we're really talking about student learning, which is really important in ATE. Here we could ask, what is the effectiveness of the course in terms of the gain in soft skills and technical competence? For midterm outcomes, we want to know how this project is affecting um, what students do. So we could ask, what is the effectiveness of the course in improving student retention? Are they staying in their programs? And finally, if the project is of sufficient duration and the evaluation is sufficiently resourced, we could look at the project's effect on employment and, and or education outcomes. So now we have a good solid set of five questions that cut across all the levels of the project and we can plan data collection accordingly um, and when we get to the interpretation stage, we know exactly what we're trying to find out. So one of the points here is a prerequisite to actually reaching evaluative conclusions, what we're calling valuing, is actually asking evaluation questions. And these questions should align with goals, but they aren't the same as project goals. And we're get, so we're going to take a question break now, and then when we come back to the uh, next portion, we're actually going to get to actually 
how we will answer evaluation questions. So if you have any questions, we can take those now, and I'll turn it over to Jason for that. Okay, thank you, Lori. All right, so we had a, a question from Edward Olson, a uh, question pertaining to whether Evaluate is considered collecting or sharing examples of questions from currently funded ATE projects. And we do do that to an extent, but uh, Lori, I was hoping maybe you could briefly share your thoughts on getting materials from ATE projects or accepting, you know, sort of submissions or examples from ATE projects. Well, thank you for that suggestion. I think it's a wonderful idea. And right now we don't have a good system in place for doing this. We fund a small group of, um, through a competitive process, a small group of evaluators to attend the ATE PI conference each year. And um, due to the good advice of one of our uh, advisory committee members, decided to make a, uh, it a requirement that those folks share an example of their evaluation work in order to get that funding. And so we do have a nice little uh, set of evaluation reports, some instruments, some plans, but uh, we didn't want to stress anybody out, so we, we, did, we said that we would not share um, that information without, without permission. So I, we, use, we look at those and we use those to know what's going on, but we aren't actually sharing them. We'd have to have some other system in place for doing that. I think it's a great idea. I will say, however, that what, most of what I've seen isn't really question driven. It's data driven, and we'll talk about that. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of reporting of lots of different kinds of data and, and some conclusions, but I, I'm not seeing a heavy focus on here's what we're trying to find out, here's our data, and here's our conclusions. And that's part of the reason we're, um, we're, we focus this webinar the way we have. But it, I would love to see more sharing of evaluation uh, examples and materials in ATE. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mike asks, uh, my college wants to know what impact uh, the program has on their students. Uh, but the struggle is to connect faculty professional development activities to impact for students. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a struggle for a lot of people, even what we do here at Evaluate. What, what difference does it make? How does that impact trickle down? And I think one of the most effective models for getting at that is the Kirkpatrick model, which is for professional development and business. And, and we had a webinar on this in November, but you know, to try to connect the dots, because it is if you jump right at student impact, it's, it's hard to make a case. But if you can um, find out from faculty, you know, what gains they made, what do they know that they didn't know before, how are they teaching differently? So you have to follow up. How are they teaching differently? What are they doing differently? Um, and, and to ask them directly what difference they're seeing in their students, and then to try to get some data directly from students, whether it's through um, you know, performance measurement or even just surveys and self-assessment and try to connect those dots. It's, it's certainly not easy to do, but it's, if you get data at the different levels um, of impact, what are people learning, what are they doing differently, and then you can try to build a case about now what is different in the world because we did this. There's no easy answer to that, unfortunately. Okay, great. Also, uh, this was a question that we got actually from outside of the webinar, but it relates. So goals are written as SMART goals, meaning they're specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Can they be used to focus an evaluation? Uh, I am not a fan of SMART goals. That may not be a popular uh, stance. I think um, People have gotten frustrated with goals being written in very vague and lofty ways, and then that's a challenge to then evaluate those goals. And goal, evaluating whether goals are achieved is very important to NSF. The problem is the SMART, um, you know, especially the measurable piece of SMART, is then people want to jump to something immediately that they can count. So that's why we see these, these goal statements written as activities, I think. It's because they, they go to this SMART acronym and, well, it has to be measurable. So we'll say we're going to, like for Evaluate, we could say we're going to do six webinars a year, one workshop, we're going to do four newsletters. Um, that's very, very specific. What are they? Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, reasonable, something, and timely. That's, it meets all those, those activities meet all those criteria. But, you know, then it's, it's that's setting the low pretty the bar pretty low, I think, and you certainly don't need an, to pay an external evaluator thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, to to come in and say whether you 
did those things or not. And I feel like I'm straying away from the crux of the question. So, oh, you're saying, oh, is this the way? If the smart if goals are smart, can we then use them? I think smart goals are the worst, actually. I think we should write important goals and meaningful goals, and then grapple with measurement. Um, that that is a task of, for evaluators working with clients, and I, and it's certainly doable. Um, but I, I don't think we should jump to being making those goals measurable right away. And I know that maybe goes counter with how a lot of people feel about that. But I got asked the question. That's the answer. Okay. Well, thanks. So uh, please, uh, in the audience, if you have any more questions, please feel free to continue to type them in the chat box. And uh, we will uh, have a question and answer break session again after this next uh, session that Lori will present. And we'll take those questions. Okay, great. Uh, Lori, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to discuss the, the next part here. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, so this, this part of the webinar is about going beyond mere description and evaluation to reaching truly evaluative conclusions. And I mentioned earlier the three common pitfalls in evaluation, or at least three uh, among others. Um, and we've discussed the importance of defining the boundaries or the focus of an evaluation. And the second problem is making judgments, as I mentioned before, without explicitly linking those judgments or conclusions to evidence. Now, Jane Davidson, whose book, Evaluation Methodology Basics, we recommend in our handout, which is available on our website um, to support this webinar, uh, no need to look it up now. It's all just recap of what we're covering. Um, but she calls this type of reporting divine judgment, which I find incredibly clever. In her presentation, she describes it like this. I looked upon it and saw that it was good. And this kind of divine inspiration may have its place, but it's not in evaluation reports. Worst case scenario, judgments are made and there's no data at all. Um, I have definitely see this. Um, slightly better, but far less than ideal are report, reports that look like this, where you have a bunch of results from various uh, data sources, which is good. Um, things like observations, interviews, documents, institutional data, surveys. Um, and conclusions are made like this. The project seems to be making good progress. The project has developed an effective model for problem-based learning. But it's not clear at all how the evaluator translated all those data into these particular conclusions. Now the third kind of problem is when results, as I mentioned before, are presented from a data perspective. And this is what Jane calls the Rorschach inkblot. Um, and that's where you have a lot of data but no conclusions. And Jane says it looks like this basically a data dump with little or no interpretation or overall conclusions. So admittedly, a lot of people have no problem with evaluation reports of this type. Um, you see a lot of them. But imagine how this would look if this is how we operated in daily life. This guy wants to know if the data cafe is a good restaurant. And she says, well, it takes an average of 7.3 minutes to be seated. 75% of wait staff are courteous, and 58.6% of customers are highly satisfied. Now, this is not a satisfactory answer to this guy's question. And we really don't have a lot of problem talking in evaluative terms in our daily lives, a good this, a bad that, and so forth. Um, but for some reason, it becomes highly problematic. I think it's clear why it becomes problematic. It's politics, it's people's feelings, it's there's a lot of anxiety around evaluation. Um, but then we end up seeing judgments not supported by data or lots of data with no judgments. We're trying to connect those dots here. What we need are interpretive frameworks to enable us to connect those dots. I personally think that the reason, part of the reason for this disconnect is um, that our academic programs that evaluators come from, whether, I mean, it's across the gamut here, right, social science, education, business, hard science, whatever it is, tend to do a pretty good job in educating um, people about data collection and data analysis, uh, which is basically the process of cleaning, transforming, and describing data, but not so much training in how to make sense out of analyzed data so that conclusions can be made about project quality, progress, impact, 
So we're just kind of muddling our way through this process, but there are some tools that can help. We can go about interpretation in at least two ways. We can establish criteria um, that we use to judge a project's performance. And these criteria can either be sort of high level holistic or around specific indicators, so specific data points. Or we can compare performance against norms, whether we're talking about past performance um, of a similar group or comparing to other sites or other groups. But we still need a means to interpret the difference, but at least we're getting an additional perspective on the results. I'm going to show you some examples of rubrics, but first I want to look again at Jane Davidson, um, her work. This comes from her, the same book I mentioned before. It's, she calls it the general rubric. And she describes this as a starting point for developing rubrics to use in evaluation. And if we're going to use evaluative terms like these, good, excellent, adequate, marginal, fair, it's really important to be clear what we really mean when we use them. And of course you can come up with your own definitions for a specific purpose. I'm not saying this is absolutely the way it is. Um, the point is to be clear with yourself and within your stakeholder group about what constitutes performance at these different levels or whatever terminology you're going to use. Um, so this is an example of a very holistic rubric that could be applied to virtually anything and again could be a starting point for developing a more specific rubric. Um, and what I mean again by holistic is sort of taking a lot of different things into, considerate, into consideration at once instead of looking at specific variables. So holistic rubrics, um, these, we can develop these for specific situations. And I'm going to show you an example in just a minute. And these kinds of rubrics can help evaluators reach defensible conclusions in what can sometimes be a less than ideal situation, like when the evaluator is brought in late and there's no data uh, to be had or when the evaluation budget is just very negligible or the client just simply wants an external perspective. I am not advocating data-free evaluations, but sometimes uh, you face these situations. And I recently had to do this for a really interesting program at a university, not, not Western, but a different university, um, where they had internally funded several centers and institutes, and I'm just going to call those projects uh, for this example, that were based at the university. And they all had very different purposes, and they all had lots of different um, kinds of data and loads of documentation. They were doing very different things, and they were at different stages. And it simply was not feasible to create individual rubrics for each project on each criterion, not to mention the multiple pieces of data related to those criteria. So I really needed a more overarching, holistic way to look at these very different projects, where eight of them actually. So I'm going to show you this rubric, and I don't want you to panic. There's a lot of text on the next screen. You do not have to read it. We're going to zoom in on one level after I kind of show you the, the high-level view. Um, so the client wanted an evaluation of these projects, and there were eight, um, on four criteria, student impact, scholarship, external impact, and sustainability. And they had defined um, generally what they meant by those things. So I knew that was the place where I needed to start. And they really wanted evaluative conclusions. They did not want, they were not paying for just a reiteration or a summary of all the information already reported by the individual projects. They had to do a lot of reporting already. So I needed to bring something else to the situation. And to do that, I needed a framework to make determinations of how well each of these eight projects was doing on each of these criteria. So I started with the James General Rubric as a springboard, and then I created this one that you see on the screen that was tailored to this particular program and you know, clearly using the criteria that they had set up. So we're going to zoom in on this first criterion of student impact. So from the materials provided to me on, this, on these eight projects, and there was a ton, I knew that experiential learning uh, here and coursework as well as degree and certificate programs, which show up later right here, um, were key ways these projects were expected to impact students. So I made sure to include those elements in the rubric. And the other interesting thing was that the projects were at very different stages. Some were just starting out. Um, some were much further along. Some had people enrolled in their 
a degree and certificate program. Some people were just tossing around the idea. Some had very uh, established ways of engaging students, and, and, and some didn't. Um, so there, because they were at different stages, I had to account. I sort of had to account for the potential of the project. The funding was very new, but some of them had been going on a little bit longer. I had to account for their potential as well as what had already been achieved. And this holistic qualitative rubric was very flexible and allowed me to do that. And so in the last part of this webinar, I'm going to show you how I actually graph the results of this evaluation. But so if you find yourself in one of these kinds of situations, you can it doesn't have to be completely unsystematic just because of the limitations of, of the evaluation context. You can create these rubrics. Um, and apply, the, apply them systematically so you get to defensible conclu evaluative conclusions. So this is a very, like I said, a holistic rubric where you can do the same kind of thing for uh, at the indicator level. And again, indicators are those little pieces of, oh, I forgot to walk you guys through this. Yeah, you probably were reading while I'm talking. But yeah, so different, I define each level from poor, fair, good to excellent, what that would look like for each of the projects. Okay, so now we're going to look at uh, indicator-specific rubrics. So um, for this one, this is back to our fictitious example. I'm going to consider this question, what is the effectiveness of the course in improving student retention? So I've imagined two indicators here. The percent of students who self-report um, that the course positively influenced their decision to continue in their programs. And the second one would be the difference in the retention rates between course participants and a matched group. Then we would describe for each of these indicators what would be not a result that would represent no effectiveness, minimal effectiveness, moderate effectiveness, and a lot of effectiveness. So ranging from not at all to very effective. So then we plug in those ranges. So I'm saying if and these are completely arbitrary. In a real process, we'd want to really deliberate and engage a lot of folks on this, but this is me just making it up for this example. But I'm saying completely ineffective would be 9% or less of students saying that they that the course positively influenced their decision. And then it goes up from there. 10 to 29% would be minimally effective, 30 to 49% moderately effective, and then 50% or more we would consider very effective. And we do the same thing for the second indicator. Um, if our students in the course had a, a worse retention rate um, than a match group, we would say that would be 10% or less. We would say that was very, uh, that would be not at all effective. If they were 11 to 20% better, we would say that would be minimally effective, moderately effective, 21 to 29% better. And we would say it would be very effective if the students in the course had a 30% or better retention rate. So then we would collect our data and we would get our result. So I'm saying in our actual data collection, we had 55% of students attributing their decision to go on to the course and, tw and, and the students in the course having a 22% better re uh, retention rate. So then we can figure out what our actual score is. So a 55% 55 corresponds to very effective, so we give that a score of 4. And 22% down here in the second indicator corresponds to a score of 3. But these indicators are not equally robust. We are going to weight the actual difference in retention um, much more than the self-report. What people actually do is much more important than what they say they're going to do. So then we weight those, and then we, then we use those, those weightings to multiply, and we get our scores. And then we sum them. And we'll say, on, the, on this dimension, we got a 3.3 .3 on a scale of 1.4. That is an interpretive, that aids us in interpretation. This is not a scientific measurement. It's a tool to aid interpretation. And so we can say that corresponds uh, to a moderately effective result. So you can see we take the arbitrariness out of it. And, and we may not have gotten these 
cutoffs right or even the weightings right, but it's there for anybody to see and negotiate and rework if necessary. So we had our question, what is the effectiveness of the project in improving student retention? And the uh, old way of answering it would be to say, well, 25% of students said the course positively influenced their decision to continue in their, in their programs. Um, and the retention rate of course participants is 22% better than a matched, than that of a matched group. And the problem with this is that most people know, wouldn't know what to make of this. Is this good, is it not good, and so forth. Now, if we have a rubric to aid our interpretation of those data, we can provide an, more than description. We can provide an evaluative conclusion. So it would look more like this. The course was moderately effective in improving student retention according to the established to the criteria established for the project. Now, it was crucially important that we actually share those criteria and the specific results to substantiate those answers. We need to have that information available, um, like in an appendix of a report, so, those, so that we have a very transparent process. OK, I just walked you through a lot of information. So I want everybody to take a moment to stretch and wake up. We're going to have a lot more interactivity coming up. Sort of like the seventh inning stretch here. Everyone feeling good? Give a little smile face. Okay, we're going to move on. So let's say this is our actual retention rate from our 201 course. Remember, we had two sequences of, eight, of 3D printing, 201 and 202. So this is our retention rate from the, num the percentage of students in the 201 course who continue on to the 202 course. And I just want you know, use the chat box to tell me if you think this is a good result, it's a good retention rate. Yeah, Mike gave me a question mark. We don't really know. Um, it's hard to say without any other information around this, right? So it would help if we had a point of comparison. And this is where norm-based interpretation comes in. We can either look at past performance, or we can look at other sites. Um, we can look at established standards, national data, other groups. So let's add a baseline data point. Now what do you think? Does anybody want to interpret this? So it's hard to tell if the increase is just part of a natural trend or if it's due to the project. So it would be great if we could add additional years to our baseline like this. And then we can actually plot a trend line as one way of determining what might have happened in the absence of the project. Now that's looking pretty good, isn't it? And we can add um, our subsequent data in as we get it for later years. So that that is much more interpretable. But what if we had a different initial baseline data point? What if it was 15% instead of 35%. We make a new baseline trend, and things are going to look really different. Same data, um, exactly the same data, but a very different interpretation. Um, and this same procedure could be used with a comparison. That was showing change over time. Um, same thing could be done with a comparison group like this. So, you know, whether it's over time or a comparison group. Uh, still, it's a point of a point that helps you interpret results. The principles are the same. That or like that makes a big difference. Okay. So this graph shows the percentage of students who are female in ATE programs in the areas of information and communications technologies engineering technologies and agricultural and natural resources. And I think this is fairly recent data. I actually did this for, for a different purpose in a webinar in May. So we're actually going to do a poll next. I'm going to tell you where to find your poll buttons. OK, so the, what you see there on the left of the whiteboard is just a screenshot. So you want to go all the way over, right under your name. Uh, you should see a little letter, letter A, and that'll be a drop down menu. Do not use your chat box for polls, because we want the polls. Uh, Tracy's going to tally the results in a bar chart, and you won't be included if you put your 
um, answer in the chat box. Okay, so here's the poll. Overall, how would you rate these programs in terms of female participation? Obviously, you can see your answer options there. Poor to excellent. So just take a moment to register your answer using those poll buttons. All right, over there. Okay, we have a lot of people who answered, not everybody. Some people are checking their email. That's okay, I understand. Um, Tracy, you want to go ahead and um, show us the results? Okay. So let's see. Most people, 30, well, most people didn't answer, uh, which makes it hard to interpret, of course, but 31% uh, was the most common response and selected B that they thought this was fair. Okay, so let's look at it like this. Okay, so this is um, the dark green is the ATE supported programs, and the light green is all two-year colleges. And this is real data. This is data. The light green data is from the National Center for Education Statistics, and the dark green data is from our annual survey of um, ATE grantees. So we're going to do. I guess I just want to ask if does anybody want to change their answer? We won't do another poll, but if you want to change your answer, if this changes your interpretation, just raise your hand. Is it still fair? The ATE programs, I mean, are they still performing fairly with regard to representation of women in these disciplines? We're getting more people doing polling. Just raise your hand. Okay, yeah, we're getting some hand raised. So it does. It really does change it. It's again the same information, but having that uh, point of comparison can really make a difference. And um, you should. I didn't include it in the handout, but uh, we can send that out um, when we follow up with you guys. But the National Center for Education Statistics has a lot of data, and if your program is uh, one of the ones that they track, um, I mean, it has the same kind of title. It's a really interesting source of data to compare um, local programs with, with national trends. So we're going to go ahead and take another question break um, or comments. And then we'll get to our visualization portion of our webinar. Okay, great. So we did have a couple of questions that came up in the in the box uh, during that section. I think one of the interesting questions that came up was when you're dealing with rubrics, what is the point at which you go from sort of creating these instruments that are flexible and usable into uh, possibly, you know, professionally inappropriate behavior, in other words, you know, not getting solid data to base your evidence on and those sorts of things. Could you just say that one more time, Jason? Sure. So I, I believe the question is, um, when you're using these holistic rubrics that you spoke of at the beginning of the session, to what degree can you be sure that you're sort of being flexible, adaptable to the program needs and creating these measurements? versus possibly skating over to a potentially inappropriate or unethical behavior, such as, you know, not using uh, sound data principles or those sorts of things. Right. Well, it's definitely not going to be your first choice, these sort of holistic things. Um, it's really just those kind of those few situations I mentioned um, where it's just not amenable to looking, getting systematic data. Of course, that's always your, your first option. Um, for me, when I was looking at uh, applying that rubric across eight different projects, it was really important as a, sort of a to establish my intra rater reliability. Like, am I being consistent in determining how each of these projects were doing? And I would do a lot of cross checking. And I shared that rubric with the clients. And not only did I have that rubric, but then I would what I didn't show you was actually um, having each project plugged into how like. You know, if Project A was fair on student impact, I would I had a table um, like what I showed you, but I would actually write in a description of why that project was rated a fair. So again, it's just very transparent, and if somebody wants to, you know, has issue with it, it can be discussed and negotiated openly instead of it being sort of a mysterious project, which I think happens a lot now, where you have a lot of data 
and, and then you see judgments and it's difficult to connect the dots. So you always go for hard systematic data as a first choice. Um, but if that's not available, still have a system in place to interpret um, results. I mean, and again, that can be very useful uh, when you have qualitative data because you can't plug in, you know, data ranges and if you don't have, I mean, numerical data ranges if you only have qualitative data. Okay, great. Uh, so following on to that, and especially in terms of maintaining um, objectivity, how are weights determined in your in the weighting scheme? Are they done by mutual agreement, based on the literature, pulled out of a hat, et cetera, et cetera? Well, what we've done is um, what we've done for our project, as you know, Jason, is to uh, discuss those a lot internally and share them with our advisory panel. And their advice to us, which we are just getting around to this year, is to take those out to a broader audience and say, look, these are our indicators. Um, this is, these are the ranges that we think represent you know, excellent performance, good performance, fair, and so on, and to get them to say, yeah, you're, you know, no, you're being too conservative here, or you're, you know, you're being too liberal there, and to really, and also to make sure we're even looking at the right things. So the, the more engagement you can you have, you have the more valid that is going to be. I'm working with another group right now where it's just a small team of people, and they're looking at countries, um, I think 11, programs in 11 different countries. Again, similar kind of program, but executed very differently. Um, over the globe, and so they are looking at, you know, what does it take to have a really good program, and then defining those indicators, and then weighting those indicators as to what they think is the most important. And it's a small; they're doing them initially as a very as a small group, but when they present their findings um, to a larger group, that'll be very transparent, and they can discuss them and make sure they're correct. Okay, great. Uh, so when we were talking about the different types of uh, charts and graphs, and you were showing the uh, comparison versus baseline, what is sort of the most effective way to show that the project was the cause of the increase? Is it the comparison group? Is it sort of that time span thing? What 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 do you prefer, or what do you find works best? Well, you have to triangulate, right? So the more sources you can get, the better. And I'm probably not going to remember the maybe you can help me, Jason, the three things you need to establish causation. One is temporal precedence. So you want to see the effect happen after the thing that you got money to do started. So the effect doesn't, that's why we want to have that baseline to see what was happening before. Um, temporal precedence, uh, you want to rule out other possible causes. So if you're looking at enrollment, for example, in a program, you'd want to look around and see what else was going on in the context of that college, was there a huge, you know, marketing push to get more students? Another great thing is to look at um, national data, like I showed with the women. You can you can actually plot that over time and and it, see where what was happening um, historically in, in in your program, but in in a, in a national context and compare that um, because you know enroll or even enrollment overall because enrollment fluctuates right well, for various reasons and. You know, are you riding a wave, or are you really, you know, bucking the overall trend? So, what's the third condition, Jason? It's temporal precedence, ruling out other conditions. Do you remember the third one? And covariance. You have to show covariance. that the two that the two have some sort of a relationship. Yes. So, where there's more of this intervention, you get more of a result, and vice versa. So, I don't know that you could, like, to get to your original question, I don't know that you could just show that all that in one graph. That's a you know, an involved process and putting, doing triangulation and putting all those pieces together and really building a case to say, you know, this result is actually due to our intervention. And a key part, point of that is, a key ingredient to that is being open to those alternative explanations and, you know, having a skeptical view. So it's not just, it's not as simple as just showing a, a baseline or a comparison group, but that's one ingredient you can use to build a case. Okay, and one final question uh, that goes sort of along with that. So it seems like a lot of the stuff that you've talked about comes from a very practical 
standpoint, can you talk about the balance between sort of like the evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt and the sufficient evidence to prove what it is I'm trying to prove and, and maybe a little bit about striking that balance? Well, that's a really hard question. Um, <laughs> I think it, you got to consider what, uh, who's, who's bar you need to meet in terms of that. A lot, a lot of what NSF is interested in is, is accountability. Like, did you do what you said you were going to do with this grant money? That's really important. And that's different than proving results beyond a shadow of a doubt. So it really depends on, on your stakeholders, what, uh, what the stakes are, you know, how much, if you're investing a lot of resources in something, the stakes are higher and you want to be able to show it actually is worth it. So then it becomes more important. Um, I think in developing a new curriculum, for example, it's important to show that you actually did it and that it's a sound curriculum. Do you need to show that, you know, income has gone up because of that pro pro and be able to make a case for that? Probably not. So it really is contextual. Um, and the higher the stakes, the more important it is to, to get, uh, a, to make a stronger case about causation. Okay, well great, thanks. And uh, as, as always, uh, for those of you in the audience, please feel free to keep those questions coming. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Laurie. All right, thank you. So in this final part of the webinar, I'm going to share some tips for conveying findings visually. And in our next webinar in May, we're going to talk about reporting in, in a lot more depth. So visualization may be just one means you use to choose you to choose <laughs> excuse me one means you choose to communicate your results either for the individual indicators or for your overall conclusions. So why do we do this? Well, visuals are really nice to increase the appeal and readability of written reports, but the main reason to present findings graphically is to enhance and expedite understanding of results. Using visual elements like graphs and charts and maps should simplify communication. If it complicates it, you, you shouldn't do it. So I'm going to walk you through one example that um, was inspired by some charts I saw in a report several years ago. And it's always stuck with me as a great example of what not to do. And I think it's helpful to see what not to do. Um, just as it, it's helpful to look at that as well as what we should be doing. So I've fictionalized this case. Again, we're using our ATE uh, project, a 3D project as the example, showing the numbers of students enrolled in these co courses. And we're saying this is actually over three different campuses, campuses A, B, and C. So just take a moment to review these charts. And if you see anything that bothers you about them, and I hope that you do, just put it, write it down in the chat box um, real quickly. Mike says the scale, different scales, no comparison. Why are the campuses repeating? ABC are on several times. Are they different years? The scales aren't balanced. Going too fast. Several bars. Had to spend a good amount of time interpreting the results. Doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, not sure why the campus repeats. Not labeled or set up properly. X axis is unclear. Not sure how to interpret. Not, don't understand. Okay. Yeah. This is not a good example. We're gonna we're gonna sort of dissect it. I see three big problems. Actually, four. Um, three little ones and one great big one. So the first is that we're actually supposed to compare. You may not have realized this, but you're supposed to compare the values in the two graphs, upper and the lower, um, for each campus, like that. But it's difficult. Um, because they're not next to each other, which relates to the second problem, which many of you noted, is that the charts actually use different scales. Uh, so the, the, the top one here goes to 300, and the bottom one goes to 250. So if the idea was for us to compare the columns in the upper and lower charts, um, we can't actually compare the differences visually because the scales are different. And not only, and because of the scales are different, but the charts are actually the same size, the increments of 50 are actually different sizes if we can actually measure them. That little bracket there on the left is the same size as this one down here. 
So it does us no good to compare visually. And the other problem, which many of you noted as well, was that it wasn't clear why this campus ABC keeps repeating across the bottom uh, axis. Um, and I actually had to read the, the text supporting the charts to realize that it's because these are repeat these are uh, represent different years as I've labeled here. And this this is not acceptable because a good chart should stand on its own to explain you shouldn't need someone you know, either with you personally or a lot of text to explain what it means. But the bigger issue is what is even the key message from these charts? Um, they tell us the number of students enrolled in these two courses, 201 and 202, across three years and across three campuses. So I want to go back to our original evaluation questions um, and consider which of these, uh, which of those questions th these data might help us answer. And we're going to do a poll, so I just want to remind you where your poll button is then. It's right under your name there on the left side. Um, which evaluation question could help us help which evaluation question could these data help us answer? So get ready to do your poll and don't use the chat box. And here are your options. Does it help us figure out the effectiveness of the course in terms of the gain in soft skills and technical competence? Does it help us figure out the effectiveness of the course in improving student retention? Or does it help us figure out the project's effect on employment or continued education? So I'm going to you can go ahead and register your answer with your poll buttons, and we'll see how things look. Okay, I see a lot of answers. So let's go ahead and see the results. Okay, so nearly everybody who answered selected B, and you're right. Good for you. The indicator of interest here is not really the number of students enrolled in these courses, but the percentage of ATE 201 students who continued on uh, to ATE 202. So to show this well, we need an entirely different type of visualization. Believe it or not, this is the same data. It's not exactly the same data. It's an interpretation of the same data. So I've converted those raw numbers into percentages. So we have a line graph now showing the change in retention over the three years um, at each of the campuses. And we can immediately see that Campus C experienced a dramatic improvement while Campus B remained stable and Campus A improved to the same level as, as Campus C. Now, without even having to read a word, we have a good sense of what's happening in terms of retention on these three campuses, at least in these two core sequence, of course. Um, and then we can dig deeper into why the performance was so different across the campuses. And I just chose a line graph here because the lines help us see the overall trends across the campuses and across years. Um, but you could just show the same results in a bar chart if you wanted to. So just to remind us where, where we came from, this is the original two graphs. The same information, but focused on that key indicator of interest. Um, in the line graph below. So my second little tip here is to be careful with scales. Um, the manner in which you present a scale makes a huge difference. The narrower the range on the scale, the larger the differences will appear. So you can really influence how people are seeing things. We're going to do another poll. I think you guys know where your poll buttons are now, but get ready. Which poll, I mean, excuse me, which bar, bar chart shows the most variation? Is it A or is it B? So register your answer quickly. Yeah, everyone's answering B, of course. Most people are answering B. Go ahead and present the results, Tracy. Yeah, a couple people. Clicked, picked A and C, interestingly. Sorry, there was no C option. Um, but most people picked B. So let's look at this this way. Um, 
it's actually the same information. It is only difference is that we changed on the bottom one where the scale starts. So instead of starting at zero or one, we've started at four, but they both uh, the highest level goes up to eight. The next one is at six, and then five, and then four and a half. So it's the same exact information, and it really looks differently because we've used different scales. And this happens all the time in reports. Let's look at a real example. Um, when you create a chart in Excel, it's going to pick a scale for you based on a range of your data. Um, in this example, and this is the response rates for the annual ATE survey, which is going on right now. It's been going on for, what, 12 years, I guess, um, 13 years. It, the Excel automatically um, selected 85% as the minimum because of the range of the data. Um, and if you just looked at this at a glance, you would think that the response rate has fluctuated wildly over the years. But when we adjust the scale to start at zero, um, we actually see just a modest amount of variation between 88 and 100% over the years. So whether through neglect, uh, simple neglect or just laziness or over manipulation, um, scale can really impact the way um, charts are interpreted for better or worse. So in a worst case scenario, the scale, you know, people adjust the scale to intentionally misread readers in interpreting results, mislead readers. Um, and you can see that the graph on the right here, it does end up with a lot of what seems to be wasted space. So our inclination might be to just get rid of that and show the a scale that looks like this, so we're actually using space more efficiently. So you might have good reasons to uh, truncate your scale, um, and it's fine if you make that decision con consciously, but then it's important to do that consistently throughout a report, um, especially if those scales are going to, if those charts are going to be near each other, because it's, if you keep changing the scale, people are going to get very confused in their interpretations. Okay, now for pies. Uh, pie charts are rarely the best option for presenting data, especially if you have more than three or four categories. It's really difficult for people to judge variations in area as opposed to length, uh, which is much easier. And that's why bar charts generally are superior to pie charts. Here we have a pie chart showing the racial and ethnic breakdown of students in ATE supported programs. And I recycled this from an old webinar, so I believe this is actually from 2010 or 2009. Um, but the point is it's really hard to judge the relative size of each piece of pie. Um, of course, we could remedy this by adding the value labels like this. But we still have to move our eyes back and forth quite a bit to, between the legend and the, the pie chart to figure out what's what. We end up doing this, which is really annoying. Now, we can move the category labels right to the chart area like this. But that just creates new problems because the labels are rarely going to fit into the pie slices and eggs. So you have all these you know, little lines and angles and so forth, which isn't very attractive. It's just, I mean, the point is it's just harder to judge differences in area. Um, and again, pie charts are rarely the best bet. Here's a bar chart showing the same information as the pie chart showing the raw numbers instead of the percentages, however. Now, viewers can judge the relative difference in the representation of these groups much quicker by comparing the length of the bars um, and the size of the pieces of pie, which is much more difficult to judge. If we wanted to present the information as percentages, we could do that. I just chose to do the raw numbers. We also want to present the information in the best way to answer important questions. For example, we may be more interested actually in the overall numbers for underrepresented minorities than in the breakdown for all the individual groups. So if that was the case, you could do something like this so that we have the underrepresented minority groups all showing up in the same color. We can compare a little more easily. Um, we can see pretty well now that we have more green than, than anything else. So here's another view of that same chart. Um, if we did really just want to compare the underrepresented groups to the uh, to the whites and, and Asians, um, we could actually just combine them in the chart. If that was what was most important, we could combine them, and it would look like that. 
But this actually is a situation where a pie chart might work because we only have three categories. So this isn't hard, so hard to interpret anymore. This pie is much easier to digest and we can really dig in to what these results mean. Okay, so next we're going to talk about 3D. It's for the movies, not charts. Here's that same chart as I, as I showed you before, before we started messing with the color and, and condensing the, the groups. The same information. Um, and we're going to do another poll. So get your poll buttons ready. You remember where they are now. How many black or African American ATE students are represented in this chart? Is it 5,900, 5,600, 5,300, or 5,100? I think a lot most people have had a chance to answer. Tracy, would you show the results? Most people picked B. Interesting. Let's see what it actually is. It was actually 5,900. And you know why that is? I tried to make a graphic of this this morning and I couldn't. But it's because there's a plane that comes out from this bar. From here to here, we have to imagine a little ceiling there, right? So the top of the ceiling is actually right here where my finger is, not back here. And you can see that when we look at it in non-3D, like that. So you can see the 3D is, isn't, isn't just a little uh, a, a benign uh, embellishment. It actually can really distort interpretation. So this, what we have here, a very basic bar chart, is a much more accurate representation of the value. Um, and these examples I've, I've shown you with the have just have just shown one variable, um, but you can also graph summarized evaluative conclusions, which I alluded to earlier. This is a chart I've shown in previous webinars. It's the result from our uh, evaluation of Evaluate last year, where we've used the Kirkpatrick model levels as our sort of overarching criteria. How well are we reaching people? Do people like us? How much are they learning? What are they doing differently? And what are the results, the implications for evaluation practice? Um, and you can see we have both the weighted and un the weighted and unweighted. Um, the unweighted is dark, and the weighted is light differences. So again, adding to transparency, uh, people want to see what happens when we change those weights. It's very clear. It doesn't make a huge difference at this point, but at some at some point, it potentially could. So there's a lot of individual data points that are rolled up into these bar charts. Um, but very quickly, we can see how we're doing. And we can, we can see that we're doing pretty well when it comes to reach. And then when people do participate with us, they generally like us. Um, but it's definitely harder to move the needle when we get to those higher levels of learning and behavior and overall results. And we, actually, and we also have less data here, so we don't weight it as, as, as important. Um, but we're getting better at that. And we'll have those results later this year. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to show you the example. Oh, and I showed you that holistic rubric before from that, that project I worked on this year. There's actually eight projects, and I've cut it off because that would be too many to show on one screen. But here, it all fit on one page, all eight projects. Um, and it shows the results for each of those projects on, on each criterion. And like I said, it fit on all on one page very nicely. It did obviously have supporting text around it in a, in a fuller, you know, like ten-page report or so. And the busy university president, who was my primary client, um, didn't have to read pages and pages of detailed results or things he'd already read in the individual project results to get to see how these projects were doing overall and which ones were doing um, really well and which ones needed to do um, a little more. So I want to consider how we would do this for our fictional uh, 3D printing case. Here were our, the evaluation questions I came up with using the logic model. And we could just give each one of these sort of a shorthand label like this. And then we would plug in our data. We'd have rubrics set up for all of our data points. Um, as I, I walked you through two indicators, we'd have those for all of them. And then we could actually graph the results like this. 
And this is nice because then we could look at the next year's results and see very quickly where things are moving or not moving, where are we getting better, where are we losing ground, and so forth. Very quickly. It doesn't replace text. It doesn't replace narrative. But it's an enhancement. And it's, it's nice when you can pull these things out for presentations or, or whatever and be able to, to highlight the results very quickly and simply in ways that people can readily understand. So what are the implications for reporting? Well, we want to try to organize our results by evaluation question or impact level or project component rather than by data source. And by that I mean you know, having a second, here's our survey, here's our student survey results, here's our faculty survey results, here's our focus group results, here's our community survey, here's what enrollment looks like. And, but to, to focus on the bigger questions and organize that way. We also want to be um, very careful about showing the linkages between conclusions and evidence. Um, you want to do that in a body report, and you can put all the nitty-gritty details into an appendices if you don't want to make a report uh, too unwieldy. And to use high-quality charts to support key points. And that leads me right into our next webinar. Um, which is the nuts and bolts of ATE evaluation reporting. And again, we're going to be drawing on the work of our friend and colleague, Jane Davidson, who has a book uh, with that su subtitle, The Nuts and Bolts of, uh, what is it, The Nuts and Bolts of Sound Evaluation. Um, that'll be on May 15th at the same time. And you can register on our website. We're going to have a few more questions, but I'm going to turn it over to Jason now. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. And, uh, I did want to clarify, like Lori said, that in our summary graph from our project, uh, those word labels are actually just superimposed over some categories on the actual graph to make it even more sort of readable. Uh, but we didn't just sort of arbitrarily place those bars within word categories. Those are actually just overlaid. Um, so we uh, had just a couple of questions here in this section, but please, Feel free to ask any more or offer some suggestions. Uh, there were several comments in the chat box. Are there examples? Are there other places to go for infographics sort of things? So if anybody knows some, please feel free to post that in the chat box. So uh, one question here from Lara Smith is, do you know if there is a way to standardize your Excel preferences so that the scale will be consistent and you don't have to sort of delve deeply into the mechanics of Excel every time you want to generate a chart? Well, that's a really good question, Jason. I think maybe you know that better than I do. <laughs> Sorry. The uh, short answer is no. Not that I know of. Basically, what you have to do is whenever you generate a chart, um, because it is automated within Excel, as far as I know, um, it automatically will always set those scales. However, on the first panel of the format data or format axis, if you right click on the y axis on the first uh, on the first panel there's a where it says limits. This is automatic or fixed. You switch it over to fixed and you can enter whatever number you want. But you have to do that each time that you create a chart separately. Um, and that's just a, one of those quirks that makes Excel so much easier to use in a more difficult fashion. Um, so that's the short slash long answer. Uh, we have you know, a question from the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, what I tend to do is I get a graph the way I want it to be the first time, and then I copy it, and then I point it to the different data that I want it to fill. So it keeps and the formatting. It's not going to be never you can have to tweak. And I've never used the feature, uh, but yes. So Don Coleman pointed out about using graph templates. You can actually there's a panel to save the graph as a template. And then you can pull it up from the main drop down when you first insert the graph. I've not ever set it up, but I know you can do that. Oh, that's uh, but that's step. helpful as well. So Thanks. just like you said, Laura, you get it just the way you want it, and then you save it as a template, and then that way you can just recall the template anytime that you want to use that. Um, okay, so good. So those are some uh, basic mechanical questions. Aubrey Perry wanted to know, in general, are frequencies uh, our frequencies are sort of these aggregate types of data or the raw numbers better when you're presenting data. So what level of ag aggregation is preferable when you're doing data reporting? Or well, I, you know, it really, I think you really have to depend, it really depends on your context and what you're really trying to answer. Like if you just want to look at how, how has our program grown, 
um, it's probably best to just use raw numbers. You know, we had 500 students, now we have 750 students. If you want to look at proportions of, um, you know, like male to female or, or ethnic categories, it's going to be better to maybe break it down. And it's important to look at that comparison to break it down into, into percentages. Of course, if you're comparing results with different ends, like, um, then it's going to be better to use percentages. Like in a survey, rarely you have everybody answer all the questions, and so your denominator is going to change, um, and you know that means your raw your raw number would change. So that could be very confusing if you have reported with the raw number. So in that case, again, it would be a percentage. But it really will come down what what bigger question you're trying to answer or what issue issue you're investigating. I think it's very misleading if you have very small ends, like 10 or 12. I've seen even less reported in percentages. I don't know if there's a hard and fast cutoff, but if you have very small numbers, it can be misleading to report in percentages. And then it would be better to just report, report the raw numbers. OK, great, Lori, thanks. So uh, I was looking back through, and I hadn't um, seen uh, uh, too many additional questions, although folks are uh, offering some great tips in the chat box. So it would behoove everybody to take a quick look at those um, on visualization, presenting visuals. Uh, I posted a link to John Gargani's Visual C blog, which really gives a good sense of the whole um, issue with chart scaling and, and those sorts of things. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come to us in between uh, that I wanted to make sure we covered. Uh, one of them is, is it okay for an evaluator to come uh, with a rubric already sort of pre-developed or sort of a templated kind of rubric versus does that always need to involve other stakeholders in the development, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I'm not sure what's in the et cetera, but um, I don't. I don't know. I've just never seen a situation where somebody had a ready-made rubric. There might be um, some out there. It's really. I think it's so contextual. I just. I don't know where. I just can't think of a situation where there'd be something like perfect that you could just use. I think it's really good to engage different people and different perspectives on uh, in, in developing a rubric. It's always. I think the evaluator can always take the first stab at it and then engage people and have them react to it. Um, our rubric actually was inspired by um, one of our National Visiting Committee members, Barbara Pellegrini, who brought my attention to goal attainment scaling, which was used, I'm sure you know this better than I do, Jason, in like um, counseling and working individual counseling. So a person, you know, sets their goals and then you can monitor over time how well they're doing and achieving those goals. And I was looking for a resource to share with regard to that as it is applied to program evaluation instead of individual um, goals. And those, if you look up goal attainment scaling, it, they, the resources I found should have like these templates, which is nice, but it, it all has to do with expectations. Like this, you know, so you plug in, this is what we expect. This would be somewhat higher than what we expect. This would be a lot higher than what we expect. And then you do it the other way. So a notch lower. This would be somewhat less than we would expect. This would be a lot less than what we'd expect. And those trouble me a lot because people's expectations I think expectations is very different than actual performance. Um, my expectation for what I what I do is always to achieve excellence at some point. But that if we put raise had the bar that high, it would be it wouldn't be attainable. So um, I would I I bring that up because you talk about having ready made rubrics, and I've seen these templates for goal attainment scaling like applying to program evaluation, and they make me very uncomfortable when they're framed around expectations rather than what would adequate performance be on this dimension? What would excellent performance be? OK, excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for um, all of that. OK, so as evaluators, uh, you know, one of the things that we love to do is to evaluate. And so we will be um, placing uh, up momentarily our evaluation for this webinar. And you'll have about a minute to fill that out, and uh, you know, let us know some information that will help us to continually work on improving the webinars and making sure that we uh, meet everyone's needs. 
So while that survey is up, I will ask the moderators to remember not to close the window and um, take a minute to fill that out. Yeah, and we're just going to stay quiet for a minute so you guys aren't distracted. Um, but then if there are any other questions, we'll have a minute or two to, to cover those. Okay, we'll take about another 10 seconds to um, finish up with the uh, survey there. Okay, so great. Um, all right, so if there are any additional questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to take uh, the time to answer them. Again, no, please note in the chat box, there's a number of resources and links that uh, folks have typed during the webinar uh, that can help individuals with their evaluation work. Um, and I see, uh, so there was a, a couple of people that weren't done with the survey, uh, and they uh, didn't get a chance to uh, finish. Um, so you know what we do, uh, we can do, Jason, is we always include the um, link to the survey when we send out the material. So if people didn't have a chance to do it or they had to leave early, they can okay. do it. But yeah. Sure. And th that link will be available shortly after the webinar is over. Okay. So I guess uh, with that having been said, I will just like to make uh, everyone aware of a few things. So um, we have the survey there. I'd like uh, to point everyone to our website, www.evalue-ate.org, evaluate.org, and there we you'll be able to access our resource library, our evaluator directory, uh, links related to our events, including our past webinars and recordings of our webinars, slides and handouts from the past webinars, and access to our uh, conduit newsletter. So with our great appreciation uh, from everybody here at Evaluate, um, and we would like to thank Maytech Networks for doing such a great job, and uh, happy evaluating everyone. Take care. Bye.